Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome. My name is Peter Bezos, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the Hellenic American Cultural Foundation. Being of Greek extraction, I often receive humorous jokes and memes that play on Greek culture that get sent to me all day. And a couple of days ago, I received one with the following setup. An older Greek American Papu, very proud of his Greek heritage, accompanies his granddaughter to a college admissions fair. The granddaughter is speaking with a representative of a university, and the rep is trying to impress the young lady to consider the school. He says to her, you should come to our school. We have an outstanding history and classics department, both in Greek and Italian. The papu quickly interjects with a scoff and says, Italian history? The Greeks invented Italian history. The joke plays on a common refrain, which is, you know, Greeks have an outsized pride in their culture and tend to trace the origins of even the most unlikely subject, like Italian history, back to Greece. And I, normally I, I would have just laughed at the joke, but this time I was, when I, took, when I, was, when I got the joke this time, I was two-thirds of the way through uh, tonight's speaker's work titled, The Greeks, A Global History. And in one chapter of the book, the author tackles the division of the Eastern and Western Roman Empire and how it was that in both halves of the empire, people had become accustomed to thinking of themselves as Romans. The difference in the East was that they did, they did the thinking in Greek, not Latin. And with the collapse of the Western Empire, the Eastern Empire was at once Greek by language and Roman by name. In other words, a Greek-Roman Empire. So I thought, maybe that old Papu was right. The Greeks really did invent Italian history. But, but I'm, not, I'm not the expert, and fortunately for us tonight, we, the expert is in the house, flying all the, joining us all the way from London, um, Professor Roderick Beaton. Professor Beaton is the Emeritus Correus Professor of Modern Greek and Byzantine History, Language, and Literature at King's College. He grew up in Edinburgh, where he studied Latin and Ancient Greek, before going on to Cambridge to graduate with a BA in English Literature and a PhD in Modern Greek. His many books and articles on the Greek-speaking world are widely acclaimed, and he is the four-time winner of the prestigious Runciman Award. His presentation tonight will draw from his two, most, uh, two recent books, the one I mentioned, The Greeks of Global History, and Greece, Biography of a Modern Nation. Copies of the same will be available for purchase and signature following the event. Professor Beaton is a fellow of the British Academy, fellow of King's College, and commander of the Order of Honor of the Hellenic Republic. Earlier this year, Professor Beaton was made an honorary citizen of Greece, and at the swearing-in, it was noted that this honorary citizenship is simply the official recognition of a lifetime's relationship with Greek letters and Greek culture. The Hellenic American Cultural Foundation is honored and most excited to have Professor Beaton join us this evening. And for those of you who have not attended one of our events before and are asking, what is the Hellenic American Cultural Foundation? The foundation is a nonprofit founded over a decade ago whose mission is to promote the extraordinary legacy of Greek culture. Since inception, the foundation has staged over 40 high quality events focusing on the history, culture, and affairs of Greece. The foundation is able to continue this high quality programming based not only on the generosity and enthusiasm of its all volunteer board, but also because of contributions from our supporters, people like you. So if you enjoy this type of programming and wish to see more of it, please consider making a donation, big or small, to the foundation. Special thanks to board member Marilena Christodoulou for proposing Professor Beaton and helping secure the Rubin Museum for the event, to Vice Chairman Robert Shaw for helping uh, develop tonight's topic, and to our Chairman Nick Karides for his leadership. Now, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause. Please welcome Professor Roderick Beaton. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, it's very good of you to turn out on this uh, cold November evening to hear about writing the history of Greece, and um, <clears throat> even more kind of those of you who are um, really one or two of you brought my, uh, my books, inviting me to write a little autograph in them, which is always a great pleasure to do. So um, thank you all. Thank you to the Hellenic um, American Cultural Foundation, all the members of the committee, thank you, Peter, for those kind words of introduction. It's, uh, it's a really great pleasure to be uh, back, in, <clears throat> back in this city. I used to come here quite frequently for conferences on modern Greek topics um, in the 90s and the 2000s, 
but uh, my wife and I were realizing that it's actually, it's actually a decade and a half since we were last here. So thank you especially, Hellenic American Cultural Foundation, for uh, bringing, us, bringing us back across the, uh, across the water. Um, I think we must do this more often. Um, I'm sorry I don't have a Greek-American joke, so I'm just going to get on with the talk that I'd prepared. I hope, I, is, I hope I'm audible at the back, am I? Excellent, thank you. And, um, uh, well, here goes. The um, sort of title of what I'm going to be talking about is on the, uh, on the screen, and <clears throat> I should just perhaps add that the, the image is one that uh, my wife and I are particularly fond of. It was about 10 years ago, we were driving from Athens to Nafplio, and on the, <clears throat> on the road somewhere between Mykines, Mycenae, and Nafplio, we passed this bric-a-brac shop. But it wasn't just any kind of bric-a-brac, it was literally monumental. And that's a picture of it. It's an antiques shop. But they seem to have just piled up on top of one, on top of one another everything you could think of from different aspects of Greek history and culture, from the Venus de Milo to the little, the little, fi the little fishing boats that take you out to the kike. And in a way, the book, The Greeks, A Global History, kind of grew out of that image. I spent a lifetime sort of loving Greece and working on Greece and teaching modern Greek language, literature and history. But it was, you know, you're always thinking as an academic, how do all the things connect and how does the modern Greek world that I'm teaching my students connect with the Byzantine world that many of my colleagues were engaged in or the classical world that of course far more people in <clears throat> Britain and America are familiar with. And um, I just thought that kind of putting it all together. So th if you like, think of my book, The Greeks, as being the kind of written equivalent of that bric-a-brac shop. Put it all between two covers and let's see what it looks like. Well, <clears throat> what I'm, in this talk, I'm going to explore some of the ways in which Greece and Greeks have defined their position in the modern world, while at the same time, the same Greeks and Greeks, <clears throat> coming to terms with a recorded history that dates back 3,500 years. It works. <clears throat> the, long, the long story of the Greeks is the subject, subject of the later of the two of my most recent books that are on the Green. That's the one on the right, hand, <coughs> the right hand side. Whereas the earlier one, with the one that has the subtitled, the subtitle Biography of a Modern Nation, deals with only the last 300 years. Both books come right up to date at the time when they went, at least at the time when I finished writing them. And for that reason, I'm going to focus this evening, um, <coughs> and I think to be fair also, uh, Robert and Marilena were rather encouraging me to do this, um, I'm going to focus mainly on Greece and Greeks since the time of the revolution that we celebrated the 200th anniversary of quite recently, or revolution or war of independence that began just over 200 years ago <coughs> in 1821. And what I hope to do in this short talk is to give an idea of how language, ethnic identity, and the modern nation state all came together to create the modern country that is Greece, as well as the Hellenic diaspora that flourishes, as you very, very well know here, on five continents, not least, of course, this one. So let's start with Greece's biography of a modern nation and writing that story and also, in some, to some extent, um, explaining why I chose to call it that. Um, the story I <clears throat> set out to tell in the book on the left is the story of how Greece became modern. And that's a story I think I can surely share with this audience that I think is far too little known. You know it, but an awful lot of people out there do not. It's too little known and too little understood in the world of today. And proof of that was in evidence all over the international media during the financial crisis that began in 2010 and ended more or less in 2018-19. Uh, 
This was a time when cartoonists poked fun at the supposedly hapless and incompetent heirs to a once great civilization. It doesn't require a great deal of knowledge of history to realize that that once great civilization came to an end. It stopped being like that some 2,000 years ago. So, you know, where has everybody been since? What are you doing calling the Greeks of today, you know, the same, <clears throat> they're the, the throwing the discus and they ought to be living up to an imagined ideal of what their ancestors once did. Well, specialists know the answer to that question, where we've been, where the Greeks have been all that time. Today, <clears throat> there are many excellent histories of both the Byzantine millennium and the shorter but event-packed centuries that saw the formation and development of the Greek state. But outside the Greek-speaking world or beyond the limited reach of specialist historians elsewhere, all this, sadly, still today, passes most people by. And I fear, I share with you, with you this thought, one of the reasons why so many people outside Greece make such, or have made such negative and in many ways unfounded assumptions about the Greek state and its people, could it be an unintended consequence of the, the very success of the Greek national project ever since that revolution of the 1820s? During the revolution and its immediate aftermath, Greeks and their foreign supporters, the famous Philhellenes, who came from as far away as this side of the Atlantic to fight and to raise funds for the cause, um, brought off an extraordinary slate of hand. They convinced the rest of the world that the newly formed Greek nation state that they were fighting to create was the direct restoration. They used words like resurrection, resurgence, palingenesia in Greek, of the ancient civilization, an ancient civilization that all educated Europeans and the Americans of the young United States looked back to in the early 19th century <clears throat> as the cornerstone of their own civilization. Well, as we know from our history, the story of how Greece became a modern state is a bit more complicated than that. But presenting it as the direct restoration going back to ancient Greece, was enough to convince some of the most conservative regimes in the modern history of Europe to embrace Greece as the newest addition to the concert of nations. Going back to the ancient past resonated powerfully at a time when the great powers were determined to restore as much as possibly could be restored of the world as it had been before the French Revolution of 1789, and the revolutionary and Napoleonic wars that had followed it. You know, after the Congress of Vienna in 1815 uh, tried to reorganize the affairs of Europe, a lot of people were talking, powerful people in Europe, were talking about restoration, put it back the way it was before the French Revolution. Um, the monarchs came back on their thrones, old systems got restored. Well. How wonderful, you've got this radical revolution doing something in many ways new, very new and very dangerous. But you say, hang on, we are restoring the oldest civilization in Europe. You can't not love that. And it worked. For all the setbacks and tragedies that have accompanied 200 years of state building, the simple overarching truth is that in the case of Greece, the process of nation building has been a resounding success. Despite its endemic and in some cases <clears throat> continuing problems, the Greek state has continued to function ever since it was first formally established by international, <clears throat> by international treaty in 1832. During the first hundred years of its existence, it expanded its borders, and during the second hundred, it greatly strengthened its democratic institutions and it consolidated its place in international alliances. It's worth pausing just to consider the fate of some much bigger players on the European stage during the same two centuries. What happened to the Ottoman Empire? What happened to the Russian Empire? The Habsburg-Austrian Empire? 
<clears throat> not to mention other states that have come and gone during the intervening period, the USSR, the German Third Reich, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia. That success story of the Greeks has no doubt continued to be fueled and supported by assumptions, sometimes perhaps lazy ones, about Greece's ancient heritage. But the people who made that happen were not the ancient Greeks. In fact, notoriously, I mean, the Greeks, ancient Greeks gave us, if you like, everything. They invented almost everything. But one thing they never actually managed to do was to create a political state called Greece, a Greek, what we would call, nation state. It was the moderns who did that. Today's Greek nation state is not only a success story. Its success is due to the decisions, words, and actions of modern people in modern times. Theirs is the achievement that has come to be so easily, I would say, dare to say lazily sometimes, overlooked. Uh, sometimes also, dare I say, even by Greeks themselves. In my book, I set out to tell that story in a way that gives credit, tries to give credit to that achievement and to the people, the modern Greek people who made it possible. When it came to writing the biography of Greece as a modern nation, that meant giving rather more attention than is perhaps common in many history books to what might broadly be termed arts and culture. I wanted the reader to be able to eavesdrop, as it were, on how the subject uh, thinks and feels. And there you see some famous images. Poetry, fiction, visual arts, music, both traditional and popular. Film naturally had to have a place in the story. And one difference between the biography of a nation and the biography of an individual, as I pointed out in the introduction to the book, is that more often than not, a biography only gets to be written after the subject is dead and gone. In that case, a biographer has a full, completed life to look back over and can seek to find, seek and often find patterns that might not have been discernible while the person was alive. With a nation, obviously, there's no, uh, the, the lifespan of nations is unlimited, is a different matter. Greece, as the subject of this or any other biography, is alive and well. Zike Vasilevi. Who knows what twists and turns may change the shape of the story in times to come, but never mind. The analogy I drew in the introduction was, was with a celebrity biography, a genre whose obvious limitation is built in because you don't know what's going to happen next. And I accept that limitation in this case too. Try as any historian does to discern patterns that may shape the future, all that we can ever know is the past. And I believe a bio biography is always a biography. I'm very skeptical about books that claim to be the biography, let alone the definitive. The past is always changing in the sense that each generation needs to discover it for itself and from the perspective of its own time. So a little bit of a little bit of history. The Greek state has a clear beginning, or rather a series of beginnings. March 1821, we celebrated the 200 years uh, just two years ago, marks the start of the revolution that would bring it into being. And then, <clears throat> but nobody can quite agree on when the Greek revolution ended. The date that I been uh, most significant on, actually, is the 3rd of February, 1830. That was when an international protocol signed by the, uh, the representatives of Great Britain, France, and Russia was signed in London, um, and it established for the first time by international agreement that there would be an independent Greek state. But another end point for the revolution <clears throat> was two years later in May 1832 when the frontiers and the form of government, monarchy, were set out by another treaty. From that time on, from 1832, Greece existed on the map as a political state, something that had never existed before 
in all the 3,500 year recorded history of the land and its people. It wasn't just a novelty for the Greeks, it was a new kind of state in Europe. This was the first <coughs> nation state. It was a type of state that had already begun to emerge in the Americas, here, of course, first of all, and then later, latterly in South America, and later would become the norm throughout Europe too. But Greece was the first new state built on the national model to be created and internationally recognized in Europe after the Napoleonic Wars. It's a fact I never tire of pointing out. I never tire of pointing this out because no history book that I know really actually spells this out in so many words. Um, though I do make an exception for um, <coughs> this excellent book by my <coughs> friend and uh, Columbia University colleague, uh, Mark Mazower, um, <coughs> whose, uh, whose book was published on the same day as, uh, as mine in 2021. Um, so the Greek state, we can be, you, know, you can make categorical statements about it. You know when it began, you know what it is. It exists on the map. It's finite and factual. But what about the Greek nation? What do we mean by the Greek nation? If we mean speakers of the Greek language, then that nation must have existed ever since the time of the earliest surviving records in the language. In the 1850s and the 1860s, when Constantinos Paparigopoulos was writing his monumental history of the Greek nation in six volumes, that meant ever since the time of Homer, Hesiod, and the founding of the Olympic Games in the 8th century BCE. Is all that long span then to be considered the history of the Greek nation? That was the challenge that Paparigopoulos set himself and the way in which the story has almost invariably been told many times <coughs> since and embellished and enriched in Greek ever since. It all depends what you mean by a nation. And I'll say something about this now and I'll come back to it again later on. Paparigopoulos, the, the doyen of Greek, uh, modern Greek historians, himself had a deceptively simple answer. As he wrote in 1853, and you can see the quote on the, on the screen, the Greek nation is the name for all those people who speak the Greek language as their own tongue. And fair enough, if you define a nation like that, then everything else follows. But for the purposes of my book, this is the biography of the modern nation, I chose a narrower and more self-limiting definition. According to that definition, all nations in the broad sense that we understand the term and use it today are built upon a series of ideas that emerged during the second half of the 18th century during the European Enlightenment. No one has done more than the late Anthony D. Smith to define and refine this way of understanding the nation as a concept. And on the screen, you can see a definition from one of his books that I found very helpful in my own books and teaching. I won't read it, you can, you can read it on the, uh, you can see it on the screen. Or perhaps just, I will just read the last, the last few words. A single economy with common rights and duties for all members. Thank you. Thank you, you're so right. Uh, he's talking about the, end of, the very end of that quote, the rights and, duties for, rights and duties for all members. So to come back to my earlier question, when did the Greek nation, defined in broadly those terms as a specifically modern phenomenon, begin? And you won't be surprised if I tell you that I believe it was during the second half of the 18th century. And I'm saying you won't be surprised because that was precisely the time when the idea of the nation in that modern sense was taking shape in the Western world. Greek thinkers took part in that process in a movement that has come to be known in more recent times as the Greek Enlightenment. And that was an offshoot of the intellectual movement that was gathering momentum in many different parts of Europe at the time. It was during the 1790s, and not before, 
that the ancient Greek word ethnos, a word which has a very long history of usage in rather different contrasting senses, began fairly systematically to be applied to the Orthodox Christian Greek-speaking population of the Ottoman Empire in the modern sense of the word nation. But the nation, to go back to trying to define you know, what kind of thing we're talking about when we talk about a nation, the nation, unlike the state, begins as an idea. And in a way, it always, <coughs> it, it always is an idea. It's the state that exists formally, that issues passports, that defends its frontiers and so on. The nation is a broader concept. But it was the idea of the Greek nation that the veteran combatant in the Greek Revolution and later Prime Minister Ioannis Koletis tried not very precisely to put before the members of the assembly that had been charged with drawing up Greece's first constitution after independence in 1844. There are later versions of this, uh, of this statement that are more eloquent and more evocative. There's a famous one that talks about Greece having two capitals, Athens and Constantinople. But what famously Coletti's actually said in 1844, according to the official record, is these words that I've translated on the uh, screen. He's talking about uh, Greece, he puts Greece at the center of Europe, and his, the argument here is that our ancestors gave Greek culture to the West. He's thinking about the Greeks carrying the wisdom and the books and the learning from Constantinople to the Renaissance in Italy in the 15th, back in the 15th century. But then he says, through her gen regeneration to the East, he's imagining young, modern Greece exporting European civilization eastwards. And in the last sentence, <clears throat> uh, in the spirit of this oath, going back to the um, revolution, <clears throat> and of this grand idea, megali idea, are the Greek words, I have been observing the plenipotentiaries of the nation come together to decide no longer just the fate of Hellas, Greece, the modern Greek state, but of the Hellenic race, Eliniki Phili. He uses the uh, racial terms that were common at this at this time, as we would say today, the Greek nation. And this speech is usually cited as being the start of the megali idea, that grand or great idea of expanding the frontiers of the Greek state to encapsulate the whole of the Greek nation. In fact, Coletis didn't invent the idea. It had been around since the uh, very beginning of the revolution. But this speech by Coletis has been remembered ever since as a touchstone for a way of thinking that would dominate the political life, the entire political life of the Greek state and of many Greeks living far beyond its borders throughout the first century of that state's existence. And if you like, the nation was the grand idea. It was an idea that conceptually turned a disparate population of some three million Greek-speaking Orthodox Christian inhabitants of the Ottoman Empire. That's the, that's the screen on the left. Um, into, uh, <clears throat> into something resembling a political community. Citizens of the Greek state, the screen on the right, in 1844, it had much narrower borders than it does today. They numbered fewer than one million. The wider nation, loosely defined by the grand idea, or megali idea, numbered three times as many. So there are far more Greek, there are far more of the Greek nation outside the boundaries of the state than there are within it. The grand idea that would gather momentum from the 1840s into the early 1920s was the idea, firstly, that all those Greek-speaking Orthodox Christians constituted a political nation, as understood in the nationalist terms of the 19th century, and secondly, that the strategic goal of the Greek state must be to expand so as to bring as many as possible of the Greek nation, many members of the Greek nation, within its borders. But after more than half a century in the early 1900s, the state was still too weak both militarily and economically, to bring that about. 
and the nation was still too physically dispersed to, to, uh, and politically inchoate to take any kind of concerted initiative either. The end game of the, for the grand idea came, you know, the, all know this tragic story, in 1922. Instead of the state expanding to encompass the whole nation, the nation was forced to collapse in upon the state. The Treaty of Sèvres, signed on 8th August 1920, awarded Greece significant territorial gains in eastern Thrace and western Anatolia, shown in the map behind, on the map behind me. <clears throat> but that treaty, of course, was never ratified. Instead, a Greek expeditionary force in Anatolia was soundly beaten by the newly formed forces of Mustafa Kemal, later known as Ataturk, or Father of the Turks, the founder of the modern Republic of Turkey. That happened in September 1922. Instead of the Greek state expanding eastwards, as Coletis had envisioned, to incorporate the dispersed Greek nation that lived in eastern Thrace and in Anatolia, Asia Minor, a new Turkish nation state was founded in 1923. And one of the first things that Mustafa Kemal did was to expel almost all the Greeks who had lived for centuries within the borders of that state, more than a million of them. From that time until the 1990s, the Greek nation and the Greek state coincided more closely than they ever had before, though even then they never quite wholly were identical. And since the end of the Cold War in 1989, inward migration to Greece has begun to change the picture yet again. While Greeks, uh, since the early 1800s, have emigrated to create a flourishing diaspora on every inhabited continent. So the story of the Greek nation and the Greek state and the fact that they're not identical is a continuing one, a hundred years on from the national catastrophe of Smyrna in 1922. Now, before we move on to the longer story of the Greeks that connects today with the ancient past, I'd like to share some reflections on the last dozen years, and particularly on the financial and social crisis in Greece that began in 2010 with fallout from the global crash of 2007 to 8. When I gave titles to each chapter of my book, this is still the biography, uh, to reflect a stage in the life cycle of an individual, I couldn't resist for the final chapter the title Midlife Crisis. But I did tactfully, I hope, and I hope rightly, uh, add a question mark. It's now possible to reflect on that decade with a greater degree of hindsight than was possible when my text went to press uh, five years ago now, in 2018. Between 2012 and 2019, in no fewer than five general parliamentary elections and one referendum, Greek voters tried every possible democratic route to solving the crisis that had torn their society apart. To what extent any or all of these short-lived governments can be credited with its eventual solution is perhaps still debatable. In the election of July 2019, the centre-right New Democracy won a clear mandate, and that mandate was impressively renewed with an increased share of the popular vote on 25th June of this year. And that was further reinforced in local and regional elections that took place in Greece only uh, three, weeks, uh, three weeks ago, in October. <clears throat> One consequence is that the uh, parliamentary duopoly between New Democracy and a party of the left, a, a, a party of the uh, semi, sort of semi democratic, social democratic left, uh, that duopoly um, has. Um, it had served the country well from 1974 until 2012. That seems to have been more or less 
restored, though rather interesting and uh, things are happening on the left side of that spectrum today. And it's very hard, for, I think, for anyone to quite to make sense of what's happening there uh, just as we speak. But today, it really does look as though a decade of financial, social and political crisis had finally ended by 2019. But of course, that was immediately followed by others. COVID-19 struck the whole world almost immediately afterwards, in early 2020. There's a continuing crisis caused by the arrival of hundreds of thousands of refugees each year via Turkey, and that hasn't gone away. And political tensions with Greece's much larger, larger neighbour, Turkey, show no signs of being resolved anytime soon either. <clears throat> You're, I'm sure, very familiar with the issues over Cyprus, which is still over 40% of it, of course, is still controlled by the Turkish army, over rights to prospect for oil and gas below the seabed in the Aegean and also now in the Eastern Mediterranean, and over control of airspace above the Aegean. These problems aren't going to go away anytime soon. But still, despite those rather mean sometimes quite funny, but they are mean jibes in the world's media, and the prognostications of the doomsayers. Look at all the bad things that didn't happen during that terrible decade when Greece and Greeks were placed under extreme pressure by the economic collapse and the demands imposed by the so-called Troika, the International Monetary Fund, the European Commission, and the European Central Bank. I hate to tempt fate, but here goes, and just a couple of images of the, success, the successes that came out of those years. Greece did not make a chaotic exit from the Eurozone, as so many had predicted and uh, feared that it might. Greek near-bankruptcy did not bring down the architecture of the common currency of the European Union. On the contrary, I think both Greek and European institutions are the stronger for the testing time that has now passed. Public order did not break down, despite severe tensions and some certainly horrific scenes on the streets of Athens, particularly between 2010 and 2012. Civil institutions didn't break down either, as they had done during World War II <clears throat> and the German-Italian-Bulgarian occupation of the early 1940s. During the crisis decade, Greeks experimented briefly with every political solution, as I said, the, including uh, undoubted brands of populism, the same populism that could be seen gaining ground elsewhere in the world at the same time. I know I'm not going to name any names. But after 2015, the overwhelming majority turned their backs on populism. The result of the 2019 election showed a marked shift back towards the center, towards a consensus at home and a reliance on rules-based international systems abroad. And that's, that trend has been confirmed and consolidated by the most recent election results earlier this year. So perhaps, dare one think and hope that Greek electorate is maybe ahead of the times? To sum up this part of my talk, the story of how Greece has become modern is, in effect, a tale of two debts. On one side of the ledger is the cultural debt, and there's a, a quote that takes you right back to the beginning of the Greek state. Um, there's also the famous one by the English poet Percy Bysshe Shelley, who said, you know, we're all Greeks, and we owe, in effect, he said, we owe the ancient Greeks everything about our own civilization, that cultural debt first identified some 200 years ago. It's a debt <clears throat> owed collectively by our entire modern civilization to the legacy of ancient Greece. In the, in the memorable words of the acclaimed British writer and actor Stephen Fry, who was speaking on the 200th anniversary of the start of the Greek Revolution on the 25th of March, 2021, he said, Greece will never owe the rest of the world as much as the rest of the world owes to Greece. It would never, you, could, you could never get away with saying that at a bank, but it's a, it's a, you know, it's a beautiful utterance, and it, it encapsulates so much. But that's one side of the debt. The other 
and going back just as far to the early 19th century, is the long series of financial debts to foreign creditors, first chalked up during the revolution of the 1820s, and, most, and recently most starkly revealed by the bailouts of 2010, 2012, and 2015. Today, the power of the world's financial and political institutions seems bound to unweigh any claims that could be made on the cultural side. <clears throat> In hard-headed practical terms, the two debts can't really be, con be considered equivalent. But I think they are symmetrical in this. Both of them, everyone else's cultural debt to Greece and Greece's financial debts to the rest of the world, both of those are actually too large ever to be repaid in full. So now to the last, the last part of my, <clears throat> the last part of my talk. Once I'd finished writing the biography, as I call it, of Greece as a modern nation, I was left with the, the sense of something still needing to be done, an elephant in the room, if you like. In the introduction to that book, I'd quoted the words of the poet and diplomat George Seferis on the occasion when he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in Stockholm in Sweden in December. 1963. He said this, he was actually speaking in French, but this is a translation of his words. I do not say that we are of the same blood as the ancient Greeks, because I have a horror of racial theories. This is a man who had experienced the Second World War, the genocide and the policies of the Axis and particularly Hitler's Nazis. But we still live in the same country and we see the same mountains ending in the sea. And I used that sentence as one of the epigraphs at the start of my next book, The Greeks, A Global History. And this was really a kind of prequel to the earlier book, the backstory that would fill in all the missing centuries of history recorded in the Greek language. And it was also meant to address, and in a rather different way, the perennial question that runs through both books. In order for Greece, Greeks to become modern, how do they now, and how did they at different times in the past, relate or cope with that extraordinarily long history? Most especially, of course, how do they relate to that emblematic ancient civilization that the world's cartoonists had mobilized so cruelly as a taunt to the crisis-stricken Greeks of the 21st century? You'll be reassured to know that at this time of the evening, I'm not going to try to recap even the highlights of that story that stretches back some 3,500 years. Though I do, think that, <clears throat> I do think that however you tell it, and whoever tells it, it is a great story. And although it's been told over and over again in Greek, uh, allow me to say that you'll be hard put to it to find another book in English that compresses that story into a single volume of some 500 pages. That quotation from Seferis was one of my starting points. Seferis had summed up just one possible way in which Greeks in modern times have come to terms with that complex relationship to their distant past. And, of course, it's not the only one. But it turns out that this way of viewing Greek identity has a very long history. Two and a half thousand years ago, in a famous speech that I also quoted among the epigraphs to my book, the Athenian politician and philosopher Isocrates, no relation to the more famous Socrates, wrote, by so much has our city, he's referring to Athens, exceeded all mankind in matters of thought and speech that her students have become the teachers of others. She has caused the name of Greeks to be understood, not in terms of kinship anymore, but of a, of a way of thinking, and people to be called Greeks or Hellenes if they share our educational system rather than a common ancestry. And those of you who know the Gennadios Library, part of the American School of Classical Studies in Athens, will be familiar with part of that speech actually carved in marble above the entrance um, to the, uh, the Gennadios Library. 
um, Elines Calusi y Simetejones, dicen imiteras pedias. For some Greeks, then, at very different times in their history, identity has been more a matter of language and education than of biological kinship. And that was my starting point. In one sense, I was in step with the founding father of Greek historiography in Greek, Konstantinos Paparigopoulos. <clears throat> You'll remember that back in the 1850s when Paparigopoulos set out to write the history of the Greek nation, he defined his subject in terms of its language. The Greek nation, he said, is the name for all those people who speak the Greek language as their own tongue. But actually, as we've seen already, the modern concept of a nation is far harder to pin down. It isn't so simple today as it might have been in 1853. And in my previous book, I'd put that elusive concept of the nation center stage. The story of the worldwide Greeks, as I tell it in the later book, <coughs> is a story of, um, uh, I'm sorry, <coughs> is a story of the people defined by their language. The choice I made in the second book was to put the language center stage rather than <coughs> the, the nation. So this is the story of all the people living at all periods of recorded history, wherever they happen to be on the surface of the earth, who have <coughs> spoken and written and who do, do today speak and write the Greek language, again in Paparigopoulos terms, as their own tongue. And there was a good reason for making that choice, to focus on the language rather than the nation. Unlike the elusive concept of a nation, a language is a given. It's a real thing that leaves physical traces that we can follow hundreds of years later. We possess written records belonging to every century from about 850 BCE to today that testify to the continuing evolution of Greek, both as a spoken language and as a written medium for education and culture. Thanks to the discoveries of Heinrich Schliemann at Mycenae in the late 19th century and of Arthur Evans at Knossos in Crete that began in 1900, we also know that Greek was the language of the rich Bronze Age civilization that we now call Mycenaean. The Greeks of the Bronze Age used a different writing system. You can see it at the top of the screen. We call it Linear B today. But since the records dug up by archaeologists were first deciphered in 1952, we have been able to read the bureaucratic uh, records kept in an early form of the same Greek language by officials working in the palaces of Knossos, Mycenae and others more than 3,000 years ago. There are, of course, different ways to tell this story. And however you tell it, it winds up with the Greek people of today with whom I started. Some 11 million of them in Greece itself, almost one more million in Cyprus, and perhaps as many as 7 million more spread across the continents of the world. The long story of the Greeks is surely one of the richest, if not the richest, in all world history. One of the arguments I make in my book is that this isn't just a story for Greeks alone. It's a story for the world. The story of the Greeks is a story of multiple interactions, of give and take, of invention and reinvention over more than three millennia. Above all, theirs is a story of inventiveness and creativity, of an inexhaustible creativity that is surely no less in evidence in the era of COVID-19, of mass migration, and of new threats to global stability than it was at earlier formative periods in the global history of the Greeks. In writing these two books, in my conclusion now, in English and for an international readership, I hope I've gone some way towards explaining, first of all, how Greece, how Greece came to be a modern nation, and then how Greek identities have been constantly shaped and reshaped by language in the remarkable story of speakers of Greek. 
And let's not forget that Greek is one of only three languages currently commonly spoken in the world today, along with Chinese and Hebrew, that can boast a continuous tradition stretching back for more than 3,000 years. Well, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, thank you for listening. I think I've been told I should stay up here, so if you want to start throwing things at me, or perhaps better, <laughs> ask me some really interesting, challenging questions, uh, please do. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for the beautiful lecture. And I know it's an academic and logotechnic field that you express today, but as a Greek who lived in Greece and now lives in the United States, I would like to have your opinion. You touched the idea of the great nation expanding west and east. The idea of expanding to the east failed. And one of the reasons was not the ability of Kemal Ataturk. He was also the American president by the name Wilson who had accepted and created Turkey. If, in, in, in your knowledge, because you are not a politician, was the fact that the Greeks were Orthodox and Russia was also, is Orthodox, is that the reason why the West abandoned the modern Greeks and created Turkey? Thank you. Um, I think, I mean, I think the short answer is no. Um, after all, the Greeks, were, the Greeks were also Orthodox when the Philhellenes came to Greece and uh, from America and all over Europe to fight in the revolution, and uh, many of them organized to, uh, uh, to help the Greeks. And some of that, uh, some of that organization on, be on behalf of Greece in the 1820s, some of it was you know, classicists with an admiration of the classical past, but there was also an element of religious um, affiliation, religious solidarity, the Orthodox, um, uh, the Orthodox Christians being um, uh, sometimes massacred by uh, Muslim Turks, uh, roused con very considerable passions, uh, particularly in the, in the early, early United States. So I don't think, I don't think the, um, I mean, I don't know about Wilson's, uh, President Wilson's own sort of personal uh, interests, uh, or religious affiliation. Uh, it is a fact, of course, that Wilson had left, uh, you know, had really rather lost interest in the Paris peace talks before the, uh, the crucial decision was made about, uh, about Greece. But I think the, uh, you know, the more, su the more substantive part of your question, you know, why did that, how, why did the Greeks fail in that attempt, um, has a lot to do with the, actually, the internal politics of Greece at the time, and the very complicated relations, not just with the USA, but more closer to hand with the British and the French. And the, um, as you, I'm sure you know this, I mean, the great, the, the, the great charismatic leader, Eleftheris Venizelos, was on very good terms. He was a brilliant diplomat. He was on very good terms with the British and the French. But when he lost the election in November 1920, and the Greeks voted or were persuaded to vote to bring back the former King Constantine, the British and the French said, well, you know, tough. From, we, you know, we think he was on the wrong side in the Great War. We're not going to help you anymore. And I'm afraid that's what, uh, that's what happened. But you're quite right. I mean, it was, it was, the, it was, a, fail or the, it was a failure of Western support that uh, doomed the Greek expedition in Asia Minor. But, I mean, I've had, I've had some very interesting discussions that are still going on. With it's, it's only a, it's exactly a hundred years since the Treaty of Lausanne that you know re resolved um, that that re it ended that war um, and sealed the fate of all the Greeks who had to leave uh, leave Greece. And academics uh, and I think a lot of the general public in Greece too are you know they're still arguing about actually where the responsibility lies. What were the mistakes? What could have been done? Um, you know, some say it could never have worked, whoever had been in charge, and others say, well, it's down to more, you know, there were more contingent uh, facts. But thank you, for the, thank you for the question.
the, in the, at, at the front, please. Professor, thank you for your illuminating talk and uh, your two wonderful books. Uh, I had a question on your use of the word pioneer for Greeks in your book, the pioneering aspect of becoming the first nation state post the Napoleonic Wars in 1815 is one example. Uh, we know what the pioneering outcomes of ancient Greece were in intellectual life, in political life, and so on. But moving to the modern period, uh, there seems to be from your text a duality of identity that crept into the Greek environment, Greek psyche. A duality uh, where a choice between two uh, points of view were expressed. The examples are many. Uh, the first one, and, and I'm, I'm asking whether, uh, well, let me ask the, the, my first question. It's a multiple <laughs> choice question. Uh, the reason, uh, the, my first question is, why did this inventiveness, this uh, pioneering occur, both in the ancient world and the modern world? If we dismiss genetics as the reason, as Mr. Sefadis dismisses it very well. Uh, what is left? Uh, why are the ancients so unusual? Uh, I have heard theories that it was access to the sea which made them uh, alert to the world. But I'm not satisfied with only that. In the modern world, we have the additional element, the additional civilization that came in, which was the Byzantine. And the Byzantine gave the first example of this duality, if you will. And could that be the reason why there was, in effect, resilience, inventiveness, uh, tension, energy that, was, uh, that made the Greeks unique and different also in the modern period. The fact that the first duality was you're either an East Roman or a West Roman. And then in the First World War, you were either with the king or you were with Venizelos. The other duality in the Second World War was uh, were you on the left or on the right? And then you had other dualities in language, Katharevusa, or Dimotiki, and so on. It was just a constant battle with each other. So my question is, why did this happen? And is that the reason for all this energy over the period mm. of time which yeah. led to modern Greece? Yeah, thank, well, thank you. There's a, a, great, a, a, great deal in, a great deal in that. Um, and I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'm not, a, you know, I'm not, I'm not arguing for Greek exceptionalism. I'm not saying, you know, the Greeks, you know, that <clears throat> that are inherently different from other peoples. But I think, for me, what makes it why the Greeks had such an effect on some, on everybody else actually comes back to this fact of the, their language and the way they used that language, because you know. Lots of other people traded all over the Mediterranean. Lots of other people invented societies. You know, I mean, everybody, if you like, every people did that. What the Greeks slightly unusually did was they wrote everything down. They wrote down an enormous amount. And they, did, they had actually devised a system of writing which had never, been, had never existed before, that we call it the alphabet. But they used, they based, they, they was very, very ingeniously, again, adapting someone else's invention. It wasn't theirs. But they used it in such a way that the alphabet, you could actually write down 
the consonants and the vowels so that you could actually write symbols on the page that you could recreate as human speech. And that's the Greek alphabet is actually the origin of all the alphabetic systems, the Roman, the Cyrillic, the Latin that we use today. And that's a way of recording language. And it enabled the Greeks not only, you know, not only to think all these wonderful things, but actually to write down what they thought, to record what they did. And therefore, it was read by everybody else. And that, that's, so if you like, the, the short answer is, what makes them the pioneers right through, if you like, is the language and the tenacity holding to that language and the inventiveness and creativeness in using language to construct ideas and to pass them on to, to generations of the future. Thank, thank you for the question. Personal question, what provoked or led to your interest as a historian in concentrating on Greek history, modern Greek history? <clears throat> well, I mean, that's a, that's a long story. Um, the truth is I'm not a historian at all. I have no qualification in history. Uh, my two sons have, and I don't. Um, I studied, I think as Peter said at the beginning, I studied English literature. I then began to, um, uh, when I went to Greece, I did a PhD. That I was actually studying Greek folk songs. I was, I, wonderful idea. I was trying to find, you know, what was the modern Greek equivalent of, what, of, of Homer? You know, what could you find people actually singing in the mountains uh, today? And I had a wonderful time doing that. Um, yeah, exactly. But, um, uh, you know, how I became a historian was that I... Uh, in the middle part of my career, I, I was appointed to this post, which has an extraordinarily wide remit. This Korais chair um, is actually called you know, History, Language, and Literature. And this was a, you know, it was a chair that was created just over 100 years ago. And in those days, they clearly thought anything that's Greek but isn't obviously classical, you can just lump it all together and someone will take care of it. And that was what you know, the Korais professor for, was, supposed, was supposed to do. No one person can possibly do that. But I also loved the challenge. And I also, I did find, more, perhaps more seriously, teaching, uh, teaching literature to undergraduate students and graduate students as well, teaching Greek literature, um, you, can't, you, know, you, you can't do it. You can't really understand what it's all about if you don't know a lot about the history. And... This made me, you know, it set me thinking about, you know, the whole, actually, the whole relation between these disciplines, history and literature. Um, you know, it's, it's quite fashionable to think, think of literature as being, you know, it's, it's kind of on a higher plane and you don't need to know about the nitty gritty of the conditions in which people lived when they wrote something or, when, or who were the people who were reading it. But, in, in, you know, in, in to make sense of it in a Greek context, you have to do that. And then, actually, the other thing, I mean, since you, you asked it as a personal question, I'll give you a personal answer. Um, I was, I always, I really wanted to write this biography of George Seferis. And that was, that, that was my, you know, that was my first um, engagement with biography. And obviously, I came to Seferis as a student of literature and from teaching his poems in class. But in order to write the biography, and why I wanted to write the biography, was to find out how did his diplomatic career, which was just as much, you know, just as much part of his life, how did his diplomatic career intersect with the poems and the essays that he wrote? And, um, you know, I think the nicest thing that anyone ever said about the biography of Severus was, um, you know, it's also a history of Greece in the first half of the 20th century. <laughs> um, so I kind of find myself it's Severus's fault, if you like, easing the way over from literature to history. And now that I'm, I'm not you know, answerable to a, a faculty at all, I can write what I really want to write.
very much for this illuminating and enlightening presentation. Can we? And we hope you come back more often and more frequently. I'd love to. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you all. There is now a very nice reception, so please join us upstairs. Thank you.